Um, so my name is Simon. I'm the Director of Research at Cure Parkinson's, and I'd just like to welcome everybody back to the second session after a very stimulating session from Professor Barker on cell transplantation. We're now going to have a discussion about um, a small molecule approach for Parkinson's, uh, th and this involves a drug called Ambroxol. And what I'll do is I'll invite um, Richard Wise, our Director of Clinical Development, to come up and firstly explain to you why uh, Ambroxol is going into a phase three clinical trial. And then um, we'll invite um, Professor Anthony Shapira from UCL University, who is the principal investigator of the study, to um, come up and present uh, more details about that as well. So firstly, Richard Wise, please. Thank you, Simon. We, we decided more than a decade ago that one thing that Parkinson's research needed was uh, some sophisticated large-scale clinical trials to look at uh, various drug targets that uh, we felt could slow long-term new neurodegeneration in Parkinson's patients. And in 2012, we, we got an international panel together and Roger Barker was one of the founding members. There were about 10 um members at that stage we've uh, we've 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 continued to do this for um every year since then and now our committee is 22 or 23 of the world's experts um who have now prioritized about 50 drugs to go into trial so back in 2014 one of our uh international uh committee members Professor Flint Beal from Cornell University in New York suggested to us that we would study um, in the clinic Ambroxol. And it was, the idea was we were already at that stage putting mitochondrial um, and other treatments to look to improve energy uh, homeostasis in, in, in uh, dopaminergic neurons. We were putting those into trial, but there's a, a second issue that was clear that we had to deal with. And that was that waste disposal in, uh, in cells in Parkinson's seems also to be dysfunctional. Particularly, you've heard about alpha-synuclein and how it inappropriately folds. And it's very hard for cells to extrude. I mean, there's just a blockage on the on the, uh, the the waste disposal. So we were looking for drugs that could deal with that. And Flint Beal on our committee proposed Ambroxol. So that was 2014, and we prioritized it as a committee to go into trial. At the same time, or perhaps a couple of years earlier, Tony Shapiro, Professor Shapiro from Royal Free Hospital in Hampstead, um, started to, to have the same ideas and started to do research on, on Ambroxol. So when we got together as, as a group, it was a, it, it was a match made in Hampstead. And so we, over the next two or three years, we, we funded the first phase two trial of Ambroxol, uh, which, uh, Professor Shapira ran out of uh, the Royal Free Hospital. And the results of the, that trial were very successful because it's vanishingly rare to get a, a biological target uh, in neurology. You can do it in other parts of the body, but in the brain, it's difficult to um, have a biological target, which when you give a drug, the biological target responds in some way that you can measure biochemically. And this is this is what we can do with um, Ambroxol. So um, it meant that the results that Tony came up with um, in the first phase two trial that we funded were particularly pertinent. And so we were determined to start a phase three trial. And we've recently announced that that's going to go ahead um, with uh, a, a number of um, co-funders, uh, Cure Parkinson's and Parkinson's UK, and uh, the Van Andel issues, and um, and uh, John Black Foundation, and uh, because it's uh, it's a very substantial trial, but we're actually delighted that it's 
now going to go ahead. And I'm equally delighted to uh, welcome Tony up onto the podium. Uh, thank you for being here. He's going to first introduce an animation, and then he's, uh, which we're all going to watch. I haven't seen it, so I'm looking forward to seeing it. And, um, and then he's going to speak a little bit about uh, the Unboxel trial, and there'll be a panel discussion after that. Thank you very much, uh, Richard, for that uh, very nice introduction to this topic. Uh, and thank you to Kiel Parkinson's for the invitation to come and uh, chat to you today uh, about Ambroxol. Um, what I thought I'd do is slightly flip uh, the, the sequence of things. So maybe just say a few words about how we got to where we are now and then show you the animation and then maybe go through the Q&A. So I'm going to be very brief because I think you probably already know quite a bit about the, this trial and um, what you don't know will be answered in the animation. So um, how did we get here? Well, quite frequently in science, they talk about serendipity and certainly the path to um, this phase three clinical trial was really highlighted by a series of very fortunate observations um, that actually go back over some, just over 150 years um, to a disease called Gaucher disease. And Gaucher disease is a disease predominantly of children. Um, and it's a genetic disorder uh, caused by the, a mutation in a gene called GBA. I'll just refer to it by its acronym. And it, it was actually uh, interesting that people with this Gaucher disease and their family members uh, seem to get Parkinson's disease more frequently than did other people. Uh, and it was in 2009 that a paper was published which confirmed that people who carry this GBA mutation have a significantly increased risk for Parkinson's disease. So that was the sort of first interesting um, observation. At the same time, there were people in Toronto that were looking for drugs to treat this childhood disease. And they, they did a screen of, uh, of 1,400 chemicals, and they actually found Ambroxol uh, worked to counter the effects of the gene mutation. So they thought this might be a treatment for, for the children with Gaucher disease. Uh, no one seemed to take that up, though, because it was a drug or chemical without a patent for, for anything in particular. And as you know, in, in commercial life, things that don't make a profit are, are often forgotten about. Uh, and so it was until we actually picked this up, um, uh, together with the story about the gene mutation, and um, we started to test things in the laboratory to see if this drug actually would reverse the biochemical problems of um, garbage destruction that um, uh, uh, Richard mentioned. And indeed, we found it did, and it worked very well. Uh, and the thing that we found really interesting was it not only worked in people with a GBA mutation, but it also worked in those with Parkinson's disease who didn't. So it seemed to serve everybody. So we did a lot more studies in the laboratory, uh, and then we were very fortunate to, to be supported by Kiel Parkinson's to do the first phase two study uh, that we published in uh, 2020. We had started that three years before, uh, and as Richard mentioned, the study was positive. It showed that the drug was well tolerated. It's been around for, for decades as a cough linkedus. Um, but we had to show that if people took it for six months or so, uh, that it was still safe, and it was, and well tolerated. And it got into the brain, another important feature if you want to treat Parkinson's disease. And it it did what it said on the tin as well. It increased and reversed this GBA problem. So there we were. We had, were in a very good position with that. And then we started work on what is now uh, the Aspro PD study that we're about to launch. You may ask why from 2020 to 2023 did it take so long? Um, well, uh, there was something which happened in between. I can't remember what it was, but uh, it wasn't a good time to launch a trial. <laughs> um, but that's all over with now, fortunately. And uh, so here we are. And 
Uh, you will hear about the people and the organizations that have supported uh, the ASPRO PD study, uh, and I'm most grateful to them. Um, I'm going to show you the little animation now. Uh, and hopefully, if there are any questions, uh, we'll be able to answer them afterwards. My name is Alison. I'm 53 years old and was diagnosed with Parkinson's in 2015. Parkinson's can affect anyone at any age, and frighteningly, it's the world's fastest growing neurological condition. Researchers believe that Parkinson's is caused by a combination of risks, including genetic and environmental factors, as well as increasing age. Many people think of Parkinson's as being just a tremor, but it's so much more. When I was diagnosed, I was just 46, and I had been experiencing symptoms for three years. It was movement on my right side that was first affected. Gradually, my symptoms progressed and I struggled to write, work, and even carrying out simple everyday tasks became a problem. Medicines like levodopa, which I take, help control some of my symptoms, some of the time, but they don't stop or even slow down the progression of Parkinson's. It's really hard because I know that over time, as my condition worsens, current drug treatments will become less effective in treating my symptoms. Research gives me hope, and because of that, I have been supporting Cure Parkinson's for a number of years now. They're amazing and totally focused on research into a cure. A drug that has recently shown some real promise is called Ambroxol. It's widely used across Europe as a treatment for coughs and respiratory inflammation, but it could have the potential to be a treatment for Parkinson's. Professor Anthony Shapira is a Cure Parkinson's funded researcher. In 2014, researchers realised that Ambroxol could have neuroprotective properties, meaning that it may be able to protect brain cells by helping to break down and clear waste proteins that have built up in the brain as a result of Parkinson's. The findings of a small trial published in 2020 showed promising results, but the next trial, called ASPRO-PD, will see 330 people taking the drug for two years. The trial will look at the impact of Ambroxol on two types of Parkinson's. Those with idiopathic Parkinson's, where the cause is not known, accounts for the majority of people with Parkinson's. It will also look at the 10 to 15% of people living with Parkinson's who have a genetic mutation in a gene called GBA. Genes are the DNA we inherit from our parents. Changes to a gene can occur when the gene is damaged or mutates to alter the genetic message carried by that gene. We also know that the GBA mutation affects the Ashkenazi Jewish community more significantly than the rest of the population. Around 25% of people with Parkinson's in that community carry this mutation, so it's a really key piece of research for them. We all hope that Ambroxol will have an effect on every type of Parkinson's, but researchers are keen to see if there's a difference in these two groups. Just imagine, if Ambroxol does work as hoped, it could change the course of Parkinson's forever, giving people like me real hope for a better future. We'll start the panel discussion. Thank you very much, Tony. Um, so while we uh, get the microphones organized around the room, I'm just going to quickly um, start this discussion or this Q&A session by going to um, Will Cook, our um, CEO at Cure Parkinson's, and um, Caroline Russell, the CEO of uh, Parkinson's UK. This is a unique situation. No, no, not a, excuse me, not a unique situation. This is a situation where the two um, charities are collaborating um, and co-funding the uh, Ambroxol, uh, the Aspro PD study. Um, so, Will, firstly, um, I come to you while we get the microphones organised, um, and if you could just speak to how this um, clinical trial is being funded. Thank you, Simon. Uh, hello, everybody. I'm actually going to stand up so that the uh, people out there have got the pleasure of seeing uh, uh, not only me, uh, but actually much more importantly, they'll see a Caroline Russell, the chief exec of Parkinson's UK, uh, as well as uh, David Dexter, the deputy director of research of Parkinson's UK. I'm sure that both of them will want to uh, contribute in some way uh, very shortly. 
Ambroxol as Pro PD is a case study for collaboration between charities. Uh, it's a flag bearer actually for the concept of collaboration. Uh, you've seen some figures on the screen earlier on. 5.5 million pounds is what it will cost or may cost the budget for this trial. Uh, that's uh, by a factor of five, uh, uh, five times greater than uh, the figure that we've invested in a single project in the past. So we knew when we saw this coming down the line that we'd have to get a collaboration together, a multi-party collaboration to make sure we funded it. Um, I have to step back actually with some history here very quickly. Um, this, the phase two trial, the results announced in 2000, uh, was co-funded by Cure Parkinson's along with John Black, the John Black Charitable Foundation. Uh, when we saw the results of that and Tony was able to put together the phase three trial, uh, we knew that we'd have to have a much bigger collaboration. And we, we drew on our strategic partners. So Cure Parkinson's has a strategic partnership program. Uh, it, it does uh, support the ILCT committee. This is the International Committee of Neurologists, Neuroscientists that Richard Wise mentioned. Um, uh, a lot of the projects we fund that come out of that ILCT prioritization process are funded jointly by Cure Parkinson's and our partners. In this case, those partners were John Black Charitable Foundation and the Van Andel Institute in Michigan, both our strategic partners at the time. That's great, but that alongside us accounted for 3.3 million of our 5.5 million. Now, of course, we have an extraordinarily generous group of individual fundraisers, uh, including uh, time critical commitments of six figure funds that uh, six figure thumbs that enabled us to uh, commit to this trial. But as crucial for, for that were conversations we we're having at the time and this started about 18 months ago with Caroline and the team at Parkinson's UK. And we were able to collaborate with Parkinson's UK so that they would come in and match fund Van Andel and John Black so that each party was putting in three, uh, uh, 1.1 million pounds. Um, that along with other extraordinarily generous uh, foundations and charities, including Rose Trees Trust, and I know uh, funding Euro raising, raising money for us, has enabled us to commit already to the 5.5 million. We're still seeking to uh, 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 raise one of that 1 million of those 5.5, not least because our trustees have guaranteed that extra 1 million by our general funds, but you will find that we are seeking to backfill and fundraise for that 1 million. But the only way we could do this is with a collaboration and not least the collaboration with uh, Parkinson's UK. So I think I would like ask Caroline to, to stand and say a few words about that. Uh, hello everyone. Um, as Will said, I'm Caroline Russell and I'm the Chief Executive at Parkinson's UK. And first of all, thank you Will, both, both for the invite, but for a fantastic afternoon. Uh, thank you Roger for your presentation, really, really great. And I've learned a huge amount, so that, that's great. And I think the message that certainly I'm really keen that everybody walks away with is that you know, we can all learn and what we do is learn best together. And certainly for the Parkinson's community, the one message that is really clear from me and from Will is that we're here to work with you together. And actually we're much more powerful as organisations together working for the community. Um, so whatever history there's been in the past, hopefully that's now something that we can build, particularly with this project on, to look at what more that we can do in collaboration and together, because we've both got the same absolute prize at the end, which is that our community have got hope and control and that one day there is a cure for Parkinson's. And actually, I genuinely hope that Ambroxol is that, is that cure. And if it's not, whatever the next one is, hopefully we'll be doing it in collaboration because we've both got different strengths to add. So I'm absolutely delighted that we're doing this together. And fingers crossed, as I said, it's the start of many more partnership um, arrangements. Um, and uh, at that point, um, I don't wish to do a dance or a song together because it no, feels like we're in perfect unity. Maybe to that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. So, thank you very much, um, David. I'm going to come to you, David, Professor David Dexter. Um, with regards to this collaboration, uh, what what uh, type of collaboration can we anticipate between Parkinson's UK and Cure Parkinson's? 
Good afternoon, everybody. Um, so this has been funded through the Parkinson's Virtual Biotech, which was funded in 2017. So it was specifically designed to accelerate drug development. And so of the 13 Virtual Biotech projects which are running, six are phase two clinical trials. So we've got extensive experience that we can lend to the actual support of uh, ASPRO PD. So we'll be collaborating on the Joint Steering Committee. Also on the Collaborations Committee, you know, we'll be actually helping um, plan ahead so that we can actually get the product license for people with Parkinson's to actually use um, if the clinical trial is successful. Also through our innovative um, Take Part Hub, we're already helping pre-recruit um, people with Parkinson's into the clinical trial. And on the 20th of May, uh, that is World Clinical Trials uh, Day, so we've got a, a media campaign that's planned for that. And part of that media campaign, uh, we will be featuring, um, so I've, I've forgotten the name of the thing. <laughs> we'll actually be promoting the recruitment tool, which will actually be recruiting people into uh, ASPRO PD. PD so, Pretty frontline, yes. And so we'll also have um, the, the trial fully launched by then so that we'll actually be able to help advertise the uh, trial through that. So there's lots of areas that we can collaborate on to make sure that ASPRO PD is actually uh, a success. And over to Will. Yeah, I, I, won't, I, I think uh, David's covered it. Uh, apart from just saying, um, yes, the, the two main collaboration committees, the Trial Steering Committee, obviously led by Tony and UCL, but it, it includes... Um, uh, Richard Wise, I believe, on our behalf, and indeed uh, David from Parkinson's UK. Um, that's one aspect which is, uh, affects the running of the trial, of course. Uh, the collaboration committee really is there to ensure that we, if this trial is successful, we can move forward through the regulatory process and the commercial process to get the, the, the drugs to people who need it as soon as possible. Those are very important parts. How are we, the two charities, collaborating in that way? Well, we have uh, agreed... Uh, uh, commercial arrangements together. So Cure Parkinson's is sponsoring this trial. Cure Parkinson's is contracted with UCL. We are committed to the five and a half million, but equally there's a back-to-back -back arrangement between us and Parkinson's UK for their 1.1 million, by which we've agreed that they will input and assist in various areas that we are already assisting UCL. That's all I'll say. Thank you. And just on this, well, on this, sorry, to continue with this theme of um, collaboration, David, if I can just come back to you again um, with regards to what other projects or um, initiatives do you think there could be in terms of collaborations between Cure Parkinson's and Parkinson's UK? Um, well, I think, firstly, I think it's, it's on Saturday uh, that Parkinson's UK celebrates its 54th birthday. And I think one of the things that um, the charity prides itself on um, is working in partnership. Um, so it's worked in partnership, you know, across many, many areas over the 54 years. So wherever there are partnerships available, we'll actually explore the potential of working together with other people. So I can imagine that there's going to be lots of other uh, partnerships that have been developed that the two charities can actually work on. Please, um, yeah, of course, two charities both have to, under AMRC rules, uh, Association of Medical Research Charities, uh, we have to make sure that the research that we each of us fund is approved by our independent research committee. So there are certain processes which we must go through. Um, there's no doubt that we would like to continue to fund major clinical trials, and our ILCT process is a part of that. It is a driver for that. Um, I'm confident that we can um, involve and persuade Parkinson's UK to um, consider the merits of each of those uh, projects and indeed consider funding, and I'm confident that we can prevail in that regard. Um, the, other, the other thing I would mention is, of course, the multi-arm, multi-stage trial platform, MAMS, uh, the EJS Act PD uh, platform, which already PUK and Cure Parkinson's are collaborating together in order to formulate to make sure that, that is defined properly. That may be something that's for discussion afterwards or for another day. That's, that's really it. I think that's from us. Thank you very much indeed for your time. And so now we're going to open up for a general audience um, Q&A. We have a panel on the um, stage here. I'd like to um, introduce, in addition to Richard and um, Professor Shapiro, excuse me, 
um, Leah Masseline, who is our Head of Pipeline Research at Cure Parkinson's, and also um, Mairead Cullen, who is the Trial Manager for the ASPRO PD study. And if I may, I'm going to grab the first question here. I'm going to steal the <laughs> Mairead, I'm going to, Mairead, I'm going to come to you first, if you don't mind. There was a mention of something called Frontline PD which is the um, recruitment tool, one of the recruitment tools for um, ASPRO PD. Could you please just briefly um, speak to what that is and how folks could uh, get involved? Yeah, so uh, PD, oh, sorry, um, PD Frontline is an online study, which uh, is a genetic study uh, to find out whether someone has a mutation in their GBA gene or not. Um, and one of the requirements for the ASPRO PD trial is that you have to know whether you have a mutation or not. The result doesn't matter, but to be considered for the trial, we want to know that result. Um, and I think currently it's taking a good few months for that result to come back. So we're really trying to push for people to sign up to PD Frontline on their website, which you can access uh, through Cure Parkinson's um, so that they can have that result and get themselves trial ready for when we are open to recruitment. Um, I actually wondered if I could bring in Tony on that on that question as well, partly thinking ahead to other future trials and why ASPRO PD is a very powerful tool for that. Yes, so... Uh... PD Frontline. PD Frontline is, as, as Mairead has uh, just described, an online tool. It's open for all people with Parkinson's disease. So uh, everybody with Parkinson's disease can sign up. It's very straightforward. Uh, very little information is, is required from, from the uh, person. And uh, all they have to do is spit into a little tube that we send them through the post um, and then send it back to us. Uh, and we organize the genetic analysis of that. And uh, as was mentioned, we need to know that pretty much for sure um, in order for people to come into the ASPRO PD study. But it also lays the basis for other potential uh, trials that people may want to go into. So we can look at other genes as well. And if other treatments come up for specific genes, those people will be able to then go into those trials. So it, it's really an important vehicle for ASPRO PD, but it also does more than that. And I think offers a lot of opportunity for people to uh, be able to think about and go into clinical trials if they wish. Can I just, just add um, on why you might need to have that genetic analysis before ASPRO PD? Because ASPRO PD is looking for both people with GBA Parkinson's, but also people without GBA Parkinson's, with idiopathic Parkinson's. But because there are two groups, we need to know that the people in the idiopathic group don't have a GBA mutation. And that's why it's so essential for everyone to be screened before the trial. So I just wanted to... Simon, I think, can we take a question from the, from the online? Chris, can you pass it over? Yes, um, I've had a question from an individual who wants to know, would being part of this trial, the ASPRO PD trial, um, impact your opportunity to be involved in the STEM PD trial? <laughs> well, Roger and I have been good friends for many years. <laughs> um, but the short answer is, I think, yes. People generally cannot be in two clinical trials at once, and, and there has to be a period of time between the two. Uh, and sometimes being involved in a particular type of clinical trial uh, can actually be an exclusion for another type of clinical trial, depending upon the investigation. So I think the short answer is uh, yes, you probably have to choose one or the other. But I would be delighted if anybody chose ASPRO PD, just as, <laughs> just as much as I would if they, if they chose Roger's study. I mean, I would completely... Uh agree with that I, I mean I think just just to flag something for the future one of the uh, which was mentioned this multi-r multi-stage trial is, is that one of the advantage of this trial setup will be the capacity for people in arms of trials where things don't work to easily transfer into other arms of trials so you can't be in two trials at once but the, the one of the advantage of MAMS will be that people can transition from one arm to another if something may not be effective 
Roger, could you just actually say a few words about multi arm multi stage trials? Because we've mentioned it two or three times, and I think we need to set the context. Yeah. So, so this is this is um. So this is a, a, an approach to doing clinical trials, which has been well established in many other fields. So in the cancer field, this is very much the, you want me to stand up? Can you stand and look at the camera, please? <laughs> uh, so, so these MAMS trials are something that's been used for many years in the world of cancer. And, and mm -hmm. the most famous one is their STAMP trial, which they've used for prostate cancer. So the idea with these trials is that you recruit large numbers of patients, they get allocated to one of several arms, one arm is placebo, the other arms all have active treatment in it. All patients get standard of care. And in what's been thought about for MAMS is there will be three arms to begin with, two active drugs and a placebo. The trials will run for four years, but at two years, you do an interim analysis and you say, well, if one of these drugs is not working, there's no point carrying on with that arm of the study. But meanwhile, two other drugs have come along that people now sound quite interested in trialing these. So we'll set up two more arms and people will then be recruited for those as well as others mm. coming out from uh, arms which have failed to show efficacy. If one of the arms works, but if it works and cures the disease, that's the end of MAMS and that's the end of cure Parkinson's and we don't have to worry about it, which is terrific. But, but if, if one of the arms is shown to have a positive effect, then that will become a standard of care and then everyone gets put on it. So it won't, if you stay in the trial, it doesn't mean you'll be excluded from things that work, that will then just be brought into the trial. So. So the idea is it's very dynamic. It, it runs then for years. And the analogy I've always used is the way we do trials at the moment, as Tony's alluded to with his trial, is it's a bit like, you know, England play Germany. We build Wembley. We have a game of football. We all go home. We take down Wembley. And then six months later, people say, well, actually, we want to play Hungary now. So we better rebuild Wembley and have another game of football. And actually, to keep setting up trial structures and take them down is not very sensible. So this is a way to try and actually make it a UK wide, open to everybody, uh, big trial, big platform. Costs a lot of money, and that's where <laughs> we have to think about. But I mean, I've been Tony's been involved with it. Lots of us have been involved with it. I've been very much involved with the trial design, and and what we're aiming for is a trial which is very inclusive. So at the moment, we're trying to get anybody pretty much with Pogsies at any stage, which is why it's called multi-stage, multi-arm because it's several trial, um, several different agents. Uh, so pretty much anybody can be in the trial. Uh, they just can't be in two trials at once. So it, it's going to be a sort of, it's going to be a major change in how we do trials in policies if we can get it funded. Thank you very much, Roger. We have a question in the back. We have a question in the back row. Uh, just, just, just to expand on, on, on what, what, what you just explained. He said it's a trial for everybody. I think it's an area of work for cooperation between agencies to examine how it is we reach people. Um, there's this danger that we concentrate our efforts on those in the know, those who can use IT, those who attend meetings like this, um, those who are knowledgeable. And we need to expand some, expand some efforts in getting at people who don't have this kind of access, who are not as aware, because they, they can be equally as, as, as important to our participants as can I. So I wonder if we can pass that question to Mairead in the first instance in terms of thinking about the regional spread in the UK um, and how we are going to try and reach as many different communities as possible. Is your microphone. Yeah, so yeah, I completely agree. It's it's important and it's something that we've definitely um, thought about in the design of the trial. So for ASPRO, we're going to open 10 to 12 hospitals across the UK and we've put a lot of, of effort into thinking about whereabouts those sites are. So we have all the way from Plymouth up to Edinburgh um, and we've really focused on uh, ensuring their spread across the country. Um, and then in terms of recruitment and kind of ensuring that we're getting you know, a really wide uh, picture of the population, we will put a lot of that onto the actual sites. So we'll have recruitment tools within their hospitals, um, which will advertise the trial. And we will be asking the doctors and nurses who work at those hospitals to really reach out to their patients and just make sure that they're all aware that, you know, this is an opportunity for them. So it's not all just online and um, it will be a lot of face to face as well. I wonder if I could actually also just bring David Dexter back into the conversation, because, again, this is about uh, the strength of the network that Parkinson's UK has that will help and benefit the trial. Can I pass that to you? 
Yes, yeah, so, yeah, the reach of Parkinson's UK is across the whole UK. And so, but unfortunately, we don't have trial centres. And I think this is, um, as Roger says, one of the beauties of the MAMS platform is that they're decentralising quite a lot of it. So a lot of it will be able to be done uh, at home. Um, so it widens the scope of uh, people joining the trials, not necessarily in those areas that have clinical trial specialities in them. Um, so it'll be a broader brush um, approach to the whole of the UK rather than sort of regions of the UK. Um, and we'll be doing that messaging um, through our networks and in partnership with Cure Parkinson's, obviously, to try and get as diverse a population um, into the trial as possible, because that, again, is a, a big problem, um, because currently the trials are biased to white British people. And so we need to develop drugs which are across the whole of the um, community uh, that is representative of the whole, you know, whole of the UK. But we'll be using our networks as well as yours to actually try and um, get as big a recruitment across the whole UK as possible. And I'll ask for a show of hands if there's any questions from the audience while we go to Suzanne with another. I think Leah would just actually want Oh, to excuse me. Sorry. 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 No, I was just going to add that I think um, with the EJS at PD um, platform as well, they're working very hard to look at all different approaches and also looking into the potential of working with GP practices as well to try and capture people who aren't under necessarily a neurologist or a geriatrician um, to get that more diverse. Um, um, and there's one final thing on this as well. I actually wanted to bring Tony in about the, the number and frequency of uh, site, visit, site visits involved in Aspro PD, again, because I think that helps, but it's quite light touch. So, Tony, if you could comment. Yes, uh, so the visits are only every 20 weeks. So uh, really uh, fairly light touch, as you say. So uh, people don't have to make that many visits uh, over the course of the study. It's a total of about six one at the beginning, one at the end, and every 20 weeks in between of those two years. So it is it is pretty easy for people, um, certainly easier than some studies where they might have to come every month, um, which is quite onerous for people, obviously. Um, Suzanne. Hi, a, a number of people have been asking about, is it as simple as just taking a cough mixture? And if so, is there a risk that there's going to be a cough mixture shortage rather <laughs> like you know? Tony, that's you. Okay, um, well, uh, it is as simple as just taking a, a, a cough mixture this in terms of a tablet uh, once every th three one three times a day uh, but of course things are never quite as simple as you think um, and uh, if the trial is positive uh, and if we move forward certainly the ability to produce ambroxol at sufficient levels for people uh, ar around the world um, is something which will require a commercial partner. But I know that the organizations funding the, the study have thought about all of this very carefully. So uh, I don't think that there will be a shortage in inverted commas, um, hopefully not. Can I just bring Richard in on this as well, in terms of the dose that we're looking at, because it's it's not the cough mixture dose. <laughs> Uh, thank you. The, the cough mixture dose is 50 milligrams. Um, and the the daily dose um, in the trial will be three pills, each of 450 milligrams. So it's many more times the, uh, the, the dose that's effective in treating a cough. But we are looking, um, as Tony said, at the end of the trial, if it's successful, we need to get it out to potentially, well, potentially 10 million patients around the world. And uh, that's quite an ask to take three pills uh, with amounting to more than a gram a day. Um, when we did the phase two trial, there was, I think, complete compliance. So I think all patients took the, the um, their ambroxol and that's in that formulation was the same 
1250 milligrams a day, but it was in 21 separate pills. So we've consolidated. Um, so I think I think that would work, but we're, we're actually thinking four years down the line of whether it's possible to have a, a nano formulation. So Leah's uh, an expert in nano formulation. I'm speaking to a, a, a number of different companies about how we can reduce the amount. We're even looking at an intranasal approach because uh, it um, doesn't go into the whole body. It's, it's, if you use an intranasal approach, you need far less. And uh, we don't know whether that, at the moment whether that's going to be practical with Ambroxol, but it's certainly practical with some other drugs. So we're, we're looking at the various options we've got for when it's finally uh, approved for use in patients, if the trial is successful, how are we going to deliver that? And we will have aligned with a commercial company long before that so that we, we hit the ground running. Thanks, Richard. I just actually want to bring Leah in on this because um, I think in terms of the dose we're actually using in this trial, is it available, Leah? No, <laughs> that is the short answer. So, so you couldn't buy that dose. It would be, and you, it would be a lot of cough mi mixture that you would have to drink, which, which is also very sugary. So that could have, <laughs> could have some issues there. Um, and the other thing I just wanted to, to mention about the whole, um, I know Tony mentioned that there was quite a long period of time between the results and and now launching the trial, and and partly that was due to COVID. But we really did put that time to use, and part of that time was really trying to figure out this reformulation work that Joy Duffin, um, who isn't actually here today in our team, has just put a phenomenal amount of work to try and figure that out, and and we all were working on that for many many months during the pandemic. <laughs> so. Thank you, Lee. We're going to the back there for a question. Oh, yes. I've, I've got a couple of questions to ask, if you don't mind. Um, it's First of all, it's good news that there won't be any limitation on stage or the of the disease or age limitation, because at the moment there is, and it excludes so many people for trials. Um, but um, what... Um, would happen if somebody is on an existing trial and for some reason they don't believe that they're benefiting from it could they stop that and then potentially come on to this trial that's number one and the second thing is um if they're taking uh, drugs for the symptoms like levodopa etc uh, would that influence their ability to go on to this trial as uh, some existing trials do and the third thing is if somebody's on the trial uh, what happens when the trial finishes what happens to them do they just stop taking medication and just left to whatever they can yeah fend for themselves and whatever they can get hold of well i guess i should have the first shot at those uh, so the first one is uh, should should someone come off a trial if they don't think it's working, I, I would I would advise against that. Um, first of all, for the sake of the patient and the study as well, because phase three and phase two clinical studies often have placebo control, so it's possible that the person may be on a placebo. Um, but I think it is really important that we do learn from other trials going on at the same time as Aspro, uh, because those drugs may may be positive as well and, and may be useful with Ambroxol. So I, I would always advise a, a patient to stick with the trial they're in to, to, uh, to complete it. And then after a period of time, they, they can uh, apply to other trials as well, as we discussed previously. Um, you asked about whether um, people taking levodopa or other medications will be allowed to uh, continue, uh, and the answer is yes. Uh, in fact, in the ASPRO PD study, we are particularly keen to, to have people on treatment. Uh, they can stay on treatment throughout the uh, course of the study and that treatment can be increased if necessary uh, and we have designed statistical ways to account for all of this uh, 
And the third thing is what happens at the end of the study. Well, at the end of the what we call the blinded phase, there will be a six month open label study. So everybody who's been in the trial will go on Ambroxol for a period of six months. Um, and we will actually make use of that period as well. Um, but the but the main study is for two years. So uh, I think those are the hopefully uh, answering your three questions. Can, can I just ask you to clarify something for me? If somebody's on another trial and the suggestion is they should remain on the trial, they're at, I understand that. But if that trial comes to an end, can they then apply for this particular trial? Yes, we they can uh, we would prefer to see a period of three months yes to clear the between. system out yeah yeah okay and uh, that's despite any potential progression in the meantime uh, yes. or age increase obviously yes we're obviously working on the what we call the inclusion exclusion criteria in detail now um so inevitably there will be uh, some age limits, et cetera, uh, as there are in all trials. Yes. Really. But you don't know what they would be at the moment. Uh, I think we have yet to uh, make the final agreement on, on what those will be. I see. Okay, thank you very much. So before I go to a question in the second row here, well, I'm getting hand signals from uh, <laughs> Helen. We'll go, to, we'll go to an online question from Suzanne. Suzanne, um, please. I, I have two, if I may. Um, one, one to um, Professor Shapira, please. Um, what are your success criteria, please? How will you measure success? Subjective quality of life, UPDRS, lysosomal activity? All of the above. <laughs> um, but what, what we are uh, calling our primary endpoint is, is a, it is a combination of what the patient themselves, what the person with Parkinson's themselves feel, whether the drug has been successful and made them better or not, plus uh, some, some additional objective features from the treating uh, doctor. So it'd be a combination, which is our primary, but we're looking at all of the other things that you mentioned as what we call secondaries. Thank you. And if I may, um, we've had a number of questions coming in really for people who've registered with PD Frontline and Maraid. Perhaps you could just advise people on the, the time that they are waiting for the results of that. There's some concern that they've been waiting a little while, but that's. Um, we, this is all Simon's fault. Uh, Simon, <laughs> <laughs> when we made the announcement a few weeks ago, Simon did a, a sterling job on Radio 4. Thank you very much, Rory, for all your guidance on that. Um, and with that, the phones went bananas. And Rosie and I were in the office on our own that particular moment. And I think both of us wish we'd had skateboards because every phone in the office was ringing simultaneously. Um, so that said, we've had a huge number of inquiries come through. And the, the PD Frontline team is a little bit snowed under at the moment. So please do bear with us. <laughs> They are working through it. They're doing an absolutely brilliant job to get answers as quickly as possible. And we will just try and keep the communication up through newsletters and things like that. So if people have filled in the forms, um, then we will be trying to communicate with people as much as we possibly can. So please just know that this is a demand and supply issue um, and, and just all of us slightly running around um, and being a bit thin on the ground, but please do bear with us. And thank you for your enthusiasm more importantly. Wonderful. We'll go to this question in the second row. The ASPRO PD trial, uh, will the trial run until the 330th recruit have spent two years on the trial? And that point when the analysis will be, and when do you think that will be? Yes, so uh, all 330 people have to finish the study. Um, they have to have had the Ambroxol for two years. Uh, we are allowing a two-year time period to recruit all of those 330. So uh, from the moment the first patient enters the study to the moment the last person finishes the study will be four years. And then the analyses begin. So the quicker we rec can recruit, the quicker that happens. Yes, of course. If we are able to recruit in less than two years, um, then 
that makes it all the much all, all the quicker if we can get those 330 people uh, signed on in one year that takes a whole year off the study okay we have a question in the back there uh, could I just make an observation that repurposing existing drugs is supposed to be quick, but it, as you've just said, it could take four or five years. Uh, that's a long time in a person with PD's journey. So can I just make a call for a bit more urgency, if possible? Because, you know, we are deteriorating all the time. And this has been going, and we haven't found anything since the 1960s that slows or stops it. Also, we need to be clear about what, what we're looking for. We're not looking for a cure. The most I'm hoping for is something that slows it down a bit in my lifetime, so I've got more hope. Thank you very much. John? Sorry, if I can just ask you a question really about in terms of the dosage that's being used. If I understood it correctly, it's around about 20 times the normal cough mixture type dose. I'm just wondering, how, how, is there any information in advance of the study, really, looking at the effects of, of such a high dose over a prolonged period? I, I suppose I'm thinking just in very simple terms that, that you know, cough medicines are there to dry up secretions and things like that. And I just wonder whether there's a risk of drying it up to the point where you end up risking pneumonia or lobe pneumonia, something like that. Yeah, so uh, we can answer that fairly well, actually, because in the in the um, Ambroxol study that we did and published in 2020, uh, people with Parkinson's took it for six months uh, at that dose, so 1,260 milligrams, and they tolerated it very well. There were no uh, serious side effects at all. Um, so all of that was very encouraging that you can actually take this um, uh, and interesting, they, they did not uh, describe any features of secretions drying up. So I think it, the, the original formulation of Ambroxol as a cough linkedus was, uh, for the most part, to be, um, to be drunk or swallowed uh, as a tablet when you have got excess secretions. So it didn't seem to affect normal ones. Um, and interestingly, the uh, company that originally produced Ambroxol many years ago did look at uh, Ambroxol in people with um, chronic lung disease, obstructive bronchitis, for two years uh, at quite high doses, uh, and there were no problems there. So we're as reasonably confident as we can be that, that although we're using a much higher dose, it's safe and tolerated naturally. We will be monitoring the people in this study for exactly the, this, the same sort of thing. And we have a question over here. Yeah, just want to ask um, what's, what, if there's any measures being put in place to stop the pharmaceutical company hiking the price and putting it out of the reach of Parkinson's patients like Apicopone and Sifinamide? which are both, both blacklisted by the NHS, they don't they won't prescribe it. There is no company involved in this. Uh, we, we have a company who's making it for the purposes of the phase three trial. They are a small development company and they have no intention of uh, making it if, if it's if the trial is successful and it will be given to millions of patients. They are not geared up to make it at that quantity. So we will have to find a producer, a pharmaceutical producer, but typically those, it's it, the pharmaceutical companies who uh, charge a lot of money for their new products have to fund a huge R&D cost. In this case, if we approach a pharmaceutical manufacturer that doesn't have a big R&D profile, then they we're just, then people will just be paying for the production of the drug and, and not all this, the sunk costs that it's taken a company, a research and development company to bring it through. So I think it'll be, it, it will, I don't think, uh, unless it gets reformulated with other drugs, I think there's no what's called IP intellectual property here. I think it'll just be the drugs made and, and then um, available to patients at relatively low cost, I think. And I, I just wanted to add to that, Leslie, um, the, the, 
the way that this trial has been set up with the collaboration committee underpinning it is exactly to prevent that. It's about trying to find a manufacturer who will work with us to deliver a potential treatment to people with Parkinson's in the shortest possible time, because that's what this is all about. I Helen, um, my wife very rarely gives me the last word, so I'm, oh. very, I'm very uncomfortable with um, having the last word. So I'm going to hand over to you. Thank you very much. Um, so first of all, I really want to thank our wonderful panel and Simon for, for leading us through those discussions. I'm sure there are plenty more questions and answers, and I know there are plenty of questions online as well, which we will do our very best to come back to everybody with answers in, to the best of our ability over the coming days. The recording from today will also be available online so, so that people can watch again. I particularly wanted to thank Roger for a really inspiring talk earlier today. But there are a few other thank yous that I need to make. Um, I want to thank our strategic partners who are working with us to enable this trial to happen, uh, the ASPRO PD trial to happen. I want to thank Parkinson's UK because that is really going to make a huge difference in terms of not only the funding, but some of the practicalities that we're facing. But I also want to thank a huge number of people who have enabled this to happen. You know, trusts and foundations who are coming to help us to enable this to move forward. So Rose Trees is just one that's been mentioned several times. So thank you very, very much indeed, but also our own Cure Collective who have been so supportive. Mm -hmm.